All right, in this video, we're going to discuss a bunch of different organisms that have routinely been associated with bacterial endocarditis. That's not to say that they aren't associated with other things that can go wrong in the body, um, particularly um, UTIs or um, cavities, like dental cavities, um, but they represent a specific risk um, when they infiltrate the blood and then eventually set up shop um, within the heart causing um, bacterial endocarditis or infective endocarditis as you learned about in a previous video. So there are a large variety of organisms that are associated with infective endocarditis and many of them we've already talked about before and some of them we haven't yet so we're going to spend some time in this video particularly focusing on organisms that we haven't covered yet but that doesn't mean that like staph aureus which we covered in host defense host response or um, strep pyogenes can't be a significant cause of bacterial endocarditis in fact both of those are highly virulent organisms that can cause significant tissue damage. And it's important to keep in mind because um, the staphylococci and the streptococci are actually the main causes of infective endocarditis. Um, staphyl staphylococcal IE is pretty much the most common cause of healthcare associated um, and infectious endocarditis, whereas streptococcal endocarditis is typically more community acquired. Um, and when we're talking about streptococcal endocarditis, we're certainly talking about group A strep, like I was just mentioning, um, strep pyogenes. Um, we're also talking about group B strep, which we haven't covered yet um, in much detail, and we actually won't cover very much until we actually get to um, your sexuality and reproduction block, because most often group B strep is um, something that we discuss more often when we talk about maternal fetal medicine. Um, so we'll cover that one later, but group B strep is a form of strep that can be a cause of infectious endocarditis. Um, we're also gonna talk about group D strep. We haven't covered the group D strep yet. We're gonna cover that in this video, as well as a group of organisms known as the viridan streptococci, which we'll talk about here. But that's not to say that some of the non-groupable ones um, like strep pneumo um, should also be included in this group. Strep pneumo can certainly cause um, infective endocarditis. We're also going to talk about a group of organisms known as the enterococci. Um, endocarditis due to enterococci is typically associated with a history of instrumentation or surgery in the genitourinary tract. These are normal commensal bacteria of the gastrointestinal tract um, and typically only cause a problem when they've been displaced. As far as gram-negative bacteria go, you can get infective endocarditis from gram-negative bacteria, and they're kind of roughly split into two groups, the HACCP group or the non-HACCP group. Um, this abbreviation is somewhat outdated, but still useful. Um, the HACCPs are a group of fastidious gram-negative bacilli, um, and it's an acronym that used to stand for Haemophilus aphrophilus, Actinobacillus actinomycetoma comitans, um, Cardiobacterium hominis, Echinella carotens, and Kingella kinge. Uh, try saying that five times fast. Um, and then there's a whole bunch of other gram negative organisms like, say, E. coli or an organism we haven't um, talked about yet, Pseudomonas aeruginosa, which we'll actually talk about very soon coming up here. Um, these are gram-negative organisms that are also associated with infective endocarditis, but there are kind of two groups that we keep together, HACCP or non hasec so first let's talk about the mechanism by which organisms are able to cause infective endocarditis. And the main mechanism that almost all organisms have is the ability to form biofilms. So what is a biofilm? Well, really a biofilm is just a community of bacteria and they group and clump all together and they adhere together in layers. This is not a special pathogenic trait of the bacteria. This is just something that bacteria do. And a biofilm contains not only the bacteria, but also this extracellular matrix, which you can kind of see here, this like little yellow, like film-like thing forming around the vegetation. 
And this yellow film is actually the extracellular matrix that's produced by the bacteria. And when it's produced by the bacteria, that's actually going to lead to the bacteria being protected from the environment. The matrix is like a film or a slime, and it's a complex mixture of polysaccharides, lipids, extracellular DNA, and proteins. And really all it does is it creates this film, almost like a skin, that's going to protect it from environmental factors. Environmental factors like... Um, changes in pH or um, mechanical destruction, like your blood rushing fast, um, but even chemical ones like say antibiotics, because it has to get through this film before it can reach even the first layer of the bacteria. And then once it kills that, it has to kill the next layer and the next layer. So you see that by living in this community, the bacteria somewhat protects its population. There's strength in numbers, right? And numbers are pretty high. These can be very large vegetations. Some organisms will cause vegetations that are greater than 10 millimeters, um, which when you think about kind of your, um, your own anatomy, that's actually a pretty big um, spot. You're gonna be able to identify that, potentially see that with um, the naked eye. So it's a pretty interesting idea. Um, in most places, biofilms are actually communities, and they can be really polymicrobic or made of more than one bacteria. However, typically when we're thinking of infective endocarditis, we're thinking about the blood. And remember, your blood is supposed to be sterile. So if you've got a biofilm growing on a valve in your heart, well, it got there because bacteria got in the blood. So it's likely that there's only one or a couple excuse me, different organisms that are making up this bio biofilm and that one is predominating in this case. Um, but we study biofilms outside of the body and that's why you'll often see them as polymicrobic um, formations. So how does a biofilm actually form? Well, basically what happens is, let's say you get some dental work done. And anytime you get some dental work or heck, even brush your teeth, you get a little bacteremic, right? We all get a little bacteremic, hopefully at least twice a day when we brush our teeth in the morning and in the evening. Some of you are probably superstars that brush your teeth like after you eat everything. But either way, a little bit of bleeding in the gums leads to a couple bacteria from your mouth or a pharynx, whatever, getting into your blood. And then they will float and land on the surface of some sort of um, valve, muscle, prosthesis, something like that. The bacterial cells are gonna aggregate and attach, as you can see here. And as they do that, they're then able to grow and divide and kind of create this little community here. As it matures, it will also create the extracellular matrix. Then, as it gets really, really big, it's almost like too big to handle, parts of it are gonna bleb off and remove a couple um, single bacteria, which will then kind of reseed the area. So you'll get like chunks that break off. So that's a biofilm. And almost all of the organisms we're going to talk to, talk to in fact, I think all of the organisms we're going to talk to here are able to form biofilms. And when something is able to form a biofilm, that makes it very dangerous for heart valves and um, the chambers of the heart. Basically, you don't want biofilms forming anywhere in your body. It's kind of bad news, except for your gastrointestinal tract. There, it's helpful. All right, so let's start talking about the organisms. We're going to start with a group of organisms known as the viridan streptococci, okay? Um, the viridan streptococci are a non-groupable streptococci, um, and they're not just one. They are their own group. They kind of made their own band, and it's a heterogeneous group of alpha hemolytic um, streptococci, okay? So even though there's a lot of different organisms in it, they're all alpha hemolytic. Um, there are a wide variety of them. We're really only going to focus on three, and whatever I say for one, you can pretty much apply to the others. S. mitis, S. mutans, and S. sanguinis. Um, so as it says in your notes, if you look at that table, table one, medically important streptococci, that's a table you've seen before. If you go back to Jamie Lopez, that's the first time you saw it. Um, now I'm kind of adding organisms to it. So the viridan streptococci are not groupable, they're alpha hemolytic, and I've given you two important biochemical properties of them. First off, they're optogen resistant. Um, these are nosocomial, or sorry, commensal, not nosocomial. These are commensal organisms, 
that live within the oropharynx and the gastrointestinal tract. So one of the little mnemonics that step one uses or first aid uses is that the viridans live in the mouth because they're not afraid of the chin. Um, that for me doesn't really work well because if you remember strep pneumo, which can also be found in the oropharynx, is actually optochin um, sensitive. So, and that's important because these are both gram positive cocci that we can find in that particular area. So you wanna be able to differentiate from them. And this is one way. So S pneumo is optochin sensitive, Viridan streptococci are optochin resistant. They're also bile resistant. So once again, if you put them in a bile solution, um, these guys won't burst, whereas something like strep pneumo would. Um, and just as I was mentioning, they are biofilm forming, okay? So they're able to form these communities um, that were, uh, that are kind of a virulence factor for them because that's how they cause disease. Um, the viridan streptococci are interesting because they're actually the most common cause of subacute bacterial endocarditis or SBE. The other thing that they do a lot of is they create cavities or dental caries, which are painful and annoying, but normally not life-threatening unless you let them go too long and they become an, ac an, an abscess. Um, so how do they do this? Well, they do this because they're really exceptionally good at sticking to slimy, slick surfaces like damaged heart valves or your teeth. And particularly, S. sanguinis has its own kind of method for doing this. S. sanguinis makes dextrans, which are able to bind to the fibrin platelet aggregates that we find on patients with damaged heart valves. So it's really um, kind of a tricky way for it to get around this um, particular difficulty of binding to this slimy, slick surface. Okay, so that's the viridans streptococci. You'll note that if you're following along in the notes, I don't really go through the laboratory diagnosis um, in particular. I talk about the fact that it's optochin resistant and that you can use that to differentiate it from strep pneumo, but I didn't go into too much detail with the viridan strep just because we'd already covered that when we talked about camera Thompson part two. I'm also not going into treatment prevention and control because in the previous video, the kind of bacterial endocarditis or infective endocarditis video, um, your pathophys discipline directors, Dr. Hartley and Dr. Shaw really covered that very nicely um, with their notes. So kind of apply those throughout, okay? Um, okay, group D streptococcus. Um, so group D streptococcus is another heterogeneous group. There's a lot of those in this video. Um, and it includes a whole bunch of organisms, much like the Viridan streptococci. Most notably though is S. bovis, but S. bovis is not all that it seems. Um, S. bovis is kind of like its own little group and it's been broken into two biotypes, which contain three additional organisms. I know it's kind of becoming an alphabet soup. Um, so the other way that S. bovis is referred to these days is S. gallolyticus. Okay, so um, if you see S. gallolyticus, S. bovis, or group D. strep, we're talking about all the same things. So just keep that in mind. All of those are kind of equivalent to each other. So what do we, you need to know about group D. strep? Well, one, it's gamma hemolytic, okay? So that's one way to differentiate it from some of the other um, streptococcal organisms that we've talked about. Like um, the Viridan streptococci, it's bile resistant. So it's not going to be lysed if you place it in bile. It is PYR negative. What does that mean? That's a particular test that tests for the presence of an enzyme that can turn a color test. And we're gonna talk about this in a few more slides. So just kind of hang on to that for a minute. Now, I say here that is unable to grow in 6.5% salt broth, basically. Why is that important? Why am I telling you what it can't do? I almost never do that. Well, the reason is because we're next going to talk about the enterococci. The enterococci look a lot like the group D strep. In fact, it's nearly impossible to identify them um, just by looking at them. So where do they differ? Well, I'll give you two guesses. One, enterococci, it can grow in the NACL broth. Also, enterococci are PYR positive. So these two tests help you differentiate from the enterococci. The other thing that's kind of interesting about the group D strep is that they're encapsulated. 
And many of them, specifically S. gallolyticus, have a pilus-like structure, which is kind of a really helpful thing for this. So because they're encapsulated, they're able to escape the immune cells in the lamina propria, which allows them to get into the bloodstream and survive there. But remember, it's not enough to just get into the bloodstream. They need to find a surface and adhere to it so that they can form their biofilm, right? So when they get to the biofilm, to, to the structure that they wanna grow their biofilm on, they use this pilus-like structure to adhere to it. And that facilitates the colonization of this collagen-rich surfaces like the valve endothelium. That's what's going to allow it to create the biofilm that will lead to disease. So what does it cause? Well, big surprise, it causes bacteria, bacteremia and endocarditis. Um, it's normally a cause of subacute bacterial endocarditis um, where it accounts for about 2 to 6% of the streptococcal bloodstream isolates from hospitalized patients. And where do we get group D strep from? Well, most likely you get it from the gastrointestinal tract. Um, it appears to be a commensal bacteria within the gastrointestinal tract. So some way, shape, or form, it's going from the gastrointestinal tract into the bloodstream and then setting up shop on the uh, valves of the heart. There's also been a really strong correlation between um, colon cancer and group D strep um, or other lesions of the gastrointestinal tract. We know it's there, we just don't know why. The mechanism for that is unknown. Um, and it's also associated with advanced liver disease, but again, we don't know why. Okay, I'm gonna cover the enterococci and then I'll talk about the tests that I've kind of been discussing throughout the video, just in case you're kind of keeping track with the notes. So first, let's talk about the enterococci. Do not confuse these with the gram-negative bacteria known as the enterobacteriaceae. They are not the same. So remember, your, your enterobacteriaceae are things like E. coli. E. coli isn't in here. These are their very own special organisms. As their name implies, they colonize the gastrointestinal tract. Um, they were previously classified as a group D strep, according to the Lansfield groupings, because they share that group D streptococcal antigen, but then they were given their very own genus in 1984. There are 54 species in this genus, however, we will actually only talk about two, um, E. faecalis and E. facium. Um, and I will say, I really recommend checking out the sketchy micro video on this one. It's really very clear, it's about the level of knowledge you need to know. Um, so don't really, I wouldn't worry too much more about any details, um, with the exception of I talk about PYR and its growth, okay? Um, so normally when we're looking at these, there's gram-positive cocci, and they grow in pairs or short chains. They're pretty hardy organisms. They can grow anaerobically or aerobically, and as I mentioned before, they're bile-resistant. So remember, we've got a gram-positive cocci that's bile-resistant, and it's, um, normally gamma hemolytic. So at this point, how do we tell it apart from, I don't know, the viridan streptococci? Um, and then also microscopically and morphologically, it's really difficult to differentiate these guys from the strep pneumoniae. So how are we gonna be able to figure these out? Well, you're gonna use PYR and you're gonna use growth. Um, and that's kind of the main structures. The other things that are important about these guys is besides the fact their ability to grow biofilms like all of the other organisms in this talk, they have really high antibiotic resistance, like exceptionally high antibiotic resistance. So much so that they got their own name, VRE, vancomycin resistant enterococci. Um, this is likely due to a lot of factors. Just like when we talked about Staph aureus, there are all of these organisms that have been exposed to antibiotics over and over and over again. So remember, these guys colonize the gastrointestinal tract, right? So think about that. They are constantly bombarded by antibiotics in everything we eat. So we've all heard about animals being treated with antibiotics, so maybe you get a little bit there. Maybe some people dump antibiotics down the drain. That's also a way, so then it's in our water supplies. There's a lot of ways that we could get exposed to it. So some of you are sitting there and saying, oh, well, I'm a vegetarian. Okay, that's nice. Um, milk, dairy, that could also have antibiotics in it, right? It came from the cow. And then some of you might be sitting there going, oh, okay, well, I'm a vegan. Ha, perfect. You're totally safe, right? Well, no, bread molds bread molds and yeasts 
that's where most of our antibiotics come from, right? So you ever had a piece of bread in the cupboard a little too long and then you go to make a sandwich and it's got one little green spot and you say, oh, I should throw the whole thing out. No, you don't. You guys are med students. And if you're anything like grad students, you go, I will cut this piece off and then eat the rest. I'm sure it's fine. Ha! That was only the mold that you could see. Most of our antibiotics came from those molds. So there's still surviving antibiotic potentially producing fungi in that bread that you're now eating and exposing all of your enterococci to. Anyway, I'm going off on a tangent. But anyway, their location in the gastrointestinal tract makes them really highly exposed to antibiotics. And that has led to a huge amount of antibiotic resistance, specifically to penicillins, cephalosporins, things like that. So those are called VRE. So what can you use for them? Um, you can use, use linzolid, um, daptomycin, and actually many of them are still susceptible to gentamicin. And that's actually the first thing that the micro lab will check is that if you have an enterococcal infection, is it still susceptible to gentamicin? If it is, we're going to use that. If not, we'll try something else. So while I'm talking about most of these organisms as it relates to their ability to cause bacterial endocarditis, they do cause other things. Um, specifically urinary tract infections. The enterococci, um, when displaced from the gastrointestinal tract or the anal area to the urethra, they can cause UTIs. Um, and the infections are frequently associated actually with urinary catheterization or instrumentation. And remember, the reason for that is that biofilms like to grow on those um, prostheses. So a catheter is a nice slick place for an enterococcal biofilm to begin growing. Um, they're also a common cause of peritoneal infections. Um, these are a significant surgical risk. They tend to be polymicrobic, i.e. associated with aerobic or anaerobic bacteria that have been displaced um, or associated with the leakage of intestinal bacteria. So while you're going to see a lot of um, enterococci, you could see not only enterococci, but some other organisms like say E. coli or um, some of the clostridia that might be within the gastrointestinal tract. And then, of course, endocarditis, because that's why we're talking about it here. Um, enterococcal endocarditis infections typically occur in patients with damaged heart valves. It can be really dangerous, specifically because you've got such significant antibiotic resistance associated with this group of organisms. Okay, so I've mentioned PYR disc testing and bile um, resistance a couple times during this video. For those of you who just like to memorize um, facts, you can go ahead and just memorize that the enterococci are PYR positive and that the group D strep are PYR negative and kind of zone out for the next minute or so until I change the slide. For those of you who want to understand a little more, I'll go into some quick details, okay? So PYR disc testing is really only performed on gamma or beta hemolytic catalase negative gram positive cocci. So what does that mean? Well, if we're talking about gram positive cocci, we're automatically talking about staph, strep, or as we learned today, enterococci. But it's catalase negative. So really, we're just talking about strep and entero. So then you look at your gamma or beta hemolytic organisms and you figure out based on that if it's gamma hemolytic or if it's beta hemolytic, is it PYR positive or PYR negative? Okay, and why is that important? Well, most of your enterococci are gamma hemolytic, but group A strep is beta hemolytic, okay? Both of those are PYR positive. So this test kind of will further narrow down, are we talking about a PYR positive beta hemolytic organism or a PYR positive gamma hemolytic organism? Alternatively, if you're thinking it could be viridan strep, you can use the PYR negative readout to help you differentiate further. So that's kind of the justification behind it. So what are we doing with this? PYR is basically a test that detects beta naphthalamide, which is formed by the enzymatic hydrolysis of PYR or L-pyrolidonyl beta naphthalamide. Don't make me say it again. I can barely pronounce it. Um, this is hydrolyzed by py Pyro, ugh, I told you I can't pronounce this, pyrolidonyl peptidase. I don't know why I can't say that, but I just say PYR most of the time. Um, streptococcus and enterococci are both positive. Group D strep is negative. No color change means it's negative. You get this pretty pink color. It's positive. Bioescalin is actually a much easier test to kind of understand. 
um, and certainly say. So basically you have this auger that contains escalin, bile, and iron salts. As the organism grows, if it has the escalin um, enzyme, it's going to hydrolyze the escalin, which is going to cause blackening of the media due to the precipitation of iron. So the enterococci are bile escalin positive. Remember, they're bile resistant. Strep pneumo, no blackening here. They're bile sensitive, right? So they're going to fall apart in bile solutions. That's about it. Okay, if you stopped listening, time to pay back attention because we're going to go through one more group of organisms. These are the HACCEC organisms. These are a group of fastidious gram-negative rods that are associated with native valve bacterial endocarditis. What do I mean by that? I mean the valve you were born with. It's native to you. Um, it's not a prosthetic. It wasn't changed. It just is. Um, the HACCEC organisms largely colonize the upper respiratory tract, and therefore the source of the HACCEC organisms is typically related to some sort of dental disease. Another, they cause about 2% of the infective endocarditis infections that we see, and they're largely a slow-growing um, class of organisms. So anytime you think slow-growing, largely these are associated with subacute bacterial endocarditis because slow-growing uh, would tell you that this is more of a subacute process. Um, they're normal part of the oropharyngeal flora, as I mentioned earlier. Okay, so what do I mean by HACCEC? So HACCEC um, is the acronym. The H in HACCEC refers to the organism Haemophilus acrophilus. One problem, Haemophilus doesn't, acrophilus doesn't exist anymore. In 2006, it was renamed to Aggregatobacter acrophilus. So now we, it's kind of like ASEC, um, but we still say HACCEC. Um, so now you've got Aggregatobacter aphrophilus, and then you've got Aggregatobacter actinomycetacomatons. Gosh, these names today are really being a problem. So you've got these two, right? And then you've got a couple other organisms, Cardiobacterium hominis, Echinella carotens, and Kingella kinge. So we'll talk about these a little bit. Both of these aggregators are gram-positive organisms. Cardiobacterium hominis is particularly good at causing endocarditis in humans. That's part of the reason it's named cardiobacterium. This is a non-modal facultative anaerobic gram-negative bacilla. It's fermentative, it's oxidase positive, um, and it's catalase negative. This is the only one that I gave you some biochemical tests on, so you might want to pay attention to that. Um, it's found in the oropharynx and upper respiratory tract of most healthy patients. Most patients with C. hominis endocarditis have pre-existing heart disease, oral disease, or recent dental procedures. Um, and it's most often associated with subacute endocarditis because remember, all of these have a pretty slow growth curve. Iconella carotens is a microaerophilic gram-negative rod. It's a normal inhabitant of most of our mucosal surfaces, particularly the oral cavity, and much like the other ones, you guessed it, SBE. And lastly, Kingella kinge. Common etiology is basically a pediatric bacteremia. Um, it's the leading agent, actually, of osteomyelitis and of um, septic arthritis in small children. So while we also associate it with infectic, infective um, endocarditis, its real concern, where we actually worry about it, is in children who are under the age of three years old. Um, it's a gram-negative bacteria. And it's typically carried asymptomatically in the oropharynx and then can disseminate by close content. And once again, if it's going to cause um, endocarditis, it's going to be slow growing, so it's going to be subacute. And that's all I've got for the um, organisms that cause bacterial endocarditis. Good luck.